Hello, my name is Elizabeth Weekly, and today I will be presenting to you Chapter 5, Language Subordination, of Lippy Green's English with an Accent. Let's start from the beginning. Unknowingly, we choose among many sociolinguistic variants which are available to us. Our choices then form together into ways which are obvious to others in likewise communities. It's an important step to how we all interact. It would be quite difficult for anyone to reject their own language and their own way of speaking. This use of variation in language is important to construct ourselves to define our social beings and to express who we truly are. Long ago, Congress and the courts did nothing to try to protect people of color. Slowly, things began improving after the Emancipation Proclamation. However, anti-leaching legislation came before the Senate many times after the Emancipation Proclamation and before the passage of the Civil Rights Act. Yet, Senate never voted on the anti-leaching legislation. In 1922, the House finally passed the Dyer Anti-Leaching Bill, which led it to be possible for such cases to be tried in federal courts and not just in state or local courts. Still, in 2005, 10 senators voted against it. This shows that there is still some discrimination in things such as employment, housing, education, the media, court, and in day-to-day -day life. Although we have several anti-discrimination laws now, language and accent are seen as acceptable excuses to refuse others. The concept of recognition and misrecognition got philosophers interested for quite some time now. As Ricker has mentioned, Humans have a focus on commonalities which demand mutual recognition. You need to understand one's belief on language and follow those beliefs, as well as their institutional practices and education. These determine whether the individual group is denied recognition or not. As Ricker has said, everyone struggles against the misrecognition of others at the same time that is a struggle for recognition of oneself by others. Ideology or as Lippy Green defines it on page 67, is the promotion of the needs and interests of a dominant group or class at the expense of marginalized groups by the means of disinformation and misrepresentation of those non-dominant groups. This is going to be used as a framework to study and understand the subordination process. Then we have the standard language ideology, or SLI for short, which is defined in our book on page 67 as a bias toward an abstract, idealized, homogenous spoken language which is imposed and maintained by dominant block institutes and which names as its model the written language by which is drawn primarily from the spoken language of the upper middle class. SLI is the idea that there's one perfect homogenous language, and this perfect language feels that our discourse is quickly grasped and understood, and justifications from that which was seized are constructed. Now on to our educational system. Although it's not the beginning, our education system is the heart of SLI. When a child does not speak the proper standard American English, they're not to be accepted, but instead they're to be corrected quickly. The child either assimilates or they stay quiet. SLED described this as the institutionalized policy to officially set students up into speaking SAE. Most influential schools taught this Anglo upper middle class ethnically middle American English way of speaking. Their way of doing this is one, devaluing all that is not remotely relative to the privilege process, and two, putting value into the social and linguistic values of dominant institutions. We must ask ourselves, how do these dominant block institutes convince us that there's one appropriate way of speaking? As Eagleton asks it, how people come to invest in their own unhappiness. When someone is devalued for their way of speaking outside their own communities, they may start to belittle their own language. If a person were to change their way of speaking into the more socially accepted way, they would need to focus on pronunciation points given to them and try to change their way of talking. Their accent will be very difficult to change. If a group does go through the same experience though, it may bring organized resistance, and this may cause an accent reduction class to shut down due to lack of students, or movements to support certain accents publicly, and so on. 
Institutes that stand for language ideology do not ignore these acts of resistance, but they will strike back, and they will strike back hard. Now let's talk about the language subordination process. There are just a few steps to the language subordination process, which have been generated from an analysis of many reactions or actions of dominant bloc institutes when a threat appeared to the authority of the homogenous language of the nation state. Lots of public commentary on use of language and language groups formed this analysis and are similar to other models of an ideological process. Basically, what it tells us is that you need expert guidance to learn the difficulties of your mother tongue and talk to experts who have studied language. Usage we are attracted to is very wrong, so actually try instead, and you can only accomplish from that. If you don't, you're stupid, unknowing, and deviant, and nobody important will take you seriously. Doors will close to you unless you make the promise to take this guidance and learn the proper way of communicating. Then, if then, others will take you seriously and doors will open to you. People communicate to one another daily in the vernacular without special knowledge of language. It comes very casual to us speaking on our native dialogue. Our spoken language can get so complex, though, that native speakers couldn't sort everything out even if they wanted to. It is countered by solid evidence. The mystification of this message is so powerful that native people seriously believe they cannot speak their own language very well. For instance, our book described a man John Prescott, a politician, who was in a constant state of mockery, but not for his policies in the print media, more about his English. Anyone speaking in a stigmatized vernacular is promised a great deal of rewards if they adopt standard American English. However, if they continue speaking in their stigmatized varieties of English, they will be removed from their everyday rights as a citizen wherever they will go, even if they hold a great deal of intelligence. Now on to an important and well-known model of form, structures, and ideology. Linguistic form and social structures are joined together by ideology. The gain on this model started with Silverstein and other anthropolitical linguists and sociolinguists. The three of these points are bound together and cannot be separated. Although people will try to justify their behavior toward discrimination, it doesn't take them very long to put their true, harsh feelings out on an online public forum. Communication seems quite simple. People talk to others, and the others listen. However, the social space between both speakers is almost never all neutral. Each time you begin to converse with another, a collection of complex calculations begin. It comes casually with people you know but these calculations may change if you meet the president or the queen of England suddenly. Anyone can refuse to communicate by simply saying, I don't understand, even if they do, or you just will never understand when it's a difference in opinion. Refusing communication is refusing to take responsibility in the communicative act. As Clark and Wilkes Gibbs discovers, purposes in conversation change during the time of conversation. It depends on how they tolerate one another and the uncertainty of the listener's understanding to the speaker. The burden mostly falls onto the listener since they're the one best placed to assist their own comprehension. During a conversation with a native speaker and a foreigner, the first decision that the native tends to make is whether or not they're going to participate in discourse with the foreigner. Members of the dominant language group feel that they are the mighty one. Therefore, they feel that they can reject responsibility and throw it onto the one carrying an accent. If someone similar talks to you, in the book's case, Standard American English with Standard American English, even if they're unclear, their first response is not to reject them. They'll often take other factors into consideration and work hard to understand what the others is saying. Intercultural competence is important to successful communication, like underlying motivation, solidarity, or hostility. Empirical tests were run by Thackerer, Gillies, and Cheshire to examine accommodation behavior. They're not working directly with L2 accident speech, but judging based off of their studies, you would be very surprised. Both the listener and the speaker will find common grounds and work together socially and psychologically when they're motivated to do so. 
And when the speaker becomes suddenly aware that the action of accommodating or assimilating linguistically can bring in more disadvantages, they usually act away from the listener's accident speech. One's degree of accidentness cannot determine their competence in the targeted language or skill as the communicator. People with stronger foreign accents have a higher degree of competence. Accents can sometimes be an issue, especially for non-native speakers who are new to the language. Accent can hinder communication though, even if everyone involved is willing to try and understand. However, this obstruction is mainly due to negative social evaluation of the accent and rejection. Accents we hear need to go through our language ideology filter to determine whether or not we are going to reject them. On to the conclusion. Many of sociolinguistic variants are available to us to choose from while we are young. And there are many laws trying to protect others from discrimination, yet it still finds its way out through our way of speaking. There's a standard language ideology which is thrown at us from when we're young and abuses us and our rights as we grow up. We are expected to speak in such a specific, proper, perfect way or else we lose all of our rights as a citizen. Many struggle trying to speak this perfect way and end up feeling so badly about the way that they actually speak. There are several complex calculations which happen during communication. And lots of sociolinguists, philosophers, and others are studying and testing this communicative act. People tend to reject others based on their language, which also throws all responsibility onto the foreigner. I never really understood how complex communication could really be. There are so many calculations, there is so much rejecting going on through communication that you just do not think about while it is happening. It's really good to know that there are laws protecting others against discrimination. I really do feel like there would be so much more discrimination against others if there were not these laws, although that there are still discrimination coming out through our language. Language and accent should not be so widely known as an excuse to refuse people. If they have the intelligence to do something, allow them to have that ability to do what they need to do. Although the book only really discusses the native English language, I believe that this does happen across the globe. One way of speaking is not possible, not possible for everyone. And yet it is such a desirable way of speaking. Things happen so quickly. Yet it is so complex when you think about it, like the way language can be denied. I or you don't understand. It's a way of throwing the language onto the one that the accident one. A complex calculation when meeting someone, no, you know, versus meeting someone so important. It's so casual meeting someone you already know, someone you meet every day, like your friend or your teacher or coworkers versus being thrown into a room with the queen. It would be so much harder. Working together to find common grounds and successful communicative. It is crazy how important talking and communicating and listening and speaking is when it comes to working together. It is so important. It is almost one of the more important things to consider is working together through communication. And now on to my discussion questions. Number one, do you remember an occasion when you witnessed or overheard one person refusing to understand another, though the communicative content was clear? Why was the communicative burden rejected? Personally, I have witnessed someone refusing another many times before. When I used to work at a fast food restaurant, uh, some customers may come in with a foreign accent. This gives the worker the option of pretending that they don't understand the foreign customer in order to ignore the order. Uh, it may be a form of racism, but it also is a, poor, a form of pure laziness. Workers knew that if they could not, could quote unquote, could not understand what the customers were saying, they could get away with not taking the order and handing the order off to their coworker. Uh, question two, consider two unlikely but useful scenarios. Walking along the street in London, you come around a corner face to face with Mick Jagger. He's wearing a torn concert t-shirt and ripped jeans, and he grabs you by the arm. His breath is bad, and he's slurring his words. He's looking for his runaway terror, and he's also talking very fast. You don't understand he's, what he's saying in his high agitation, but it's clear he wants your help. 
You're waiting for a bus and a small crowd of people with a shabbily dressed stranger who looks a lot like McDarger approaches you, slowly with difference. In a very heavily accented English, the person asks for directions. Are you equally willing to help in both situations? Do you in fact help both these people? If not, how do you handle it? Personally, the first scenario scares me. I don't want a stranger coming at me, bad breath, uh, slurring his words, grabbing my arm in the middle of a city. Especially if I'm alone and if it's dark, it just makes it that much worse. So personally, I don't know what I would do in that scenario. I would probably run or I, I would probably call someone. I don't think I would be helping him if he would approach me more kindly and especially if I'm not alone at night, I would more likely help. In the second scenario, I would definitely help. I would definitely help if someone just walks up to me and kindly asks for directions. I've done it several times before walking in the city. It's, it's much more likely. So I would not help both these people. I would not. It would scare me. And now here is the best part. We're excited. It is the end of my slides. Have a good day. Thank you for watching. If you actually watched this far ahead, thank you. Um, have a great day or night. Bye.